let's fast forward to the horrific attacks of 7-7 in London. Prime Minister Tony Blair, leader of the Labour Party, was facing an uphill battle in parliamentary elections. National polls showed that his pro-war party was sure to lose, and then right on time, the bombings of 7-7 and 7-21 occurred. Within days of the London bombings, evidence began to emerge indicating Western intelligence agency involvement. I traveled to London from Austin, Texas to personally investigate. Once I arrived, I was met by Paul Joseph Watson and his brother Steve Watson, who are reporters for my news website, PrisonPlanet.com. <laughs> to understand the London bombings and who perpetrated them, you first need to look at 3-11-2004, the bombings in Madrid, Spain. Years after the blast that rocked trains in the city of Madrid, Spain, the government admits that Al-Qaeda had no connection to the attacks. Every one of the supposed bombers had intimate links to the Spanish security services, including the head of their bomb squad. The alleged leader of the bombers, who reportedly gave dynamite to the terrorists, was connected to the Madrid bomb squad. And we see the exact same earmarks, the same M.O., in the London bombings that we witnessed in Madrid. On the morning of July 7th, 2005, three trains and a city bus were ripped to pieces when four military-grade explosive devices detonated. At 8.50 a.m., three explosive devices simultaneously detonated on three separate trains. Within minutes, eyewitnesses were reporting to the press that there had been multiple terror attacks. Despite the fact that three train cars were burning wrecks strewn with dead and dying Londoners, Scotland Yard for over an hour and a half claimed that all of the disruptions were simply caused by a power outage in the London Underground. Power surge on the Underground, that's all we heard. Um, I mean, the bus was about an hour after the, the Underground, so... That's when I think everybody knew that it wasn't, it wasn't what it was, you know. I think it was just an excuse, power surge, whatever. Why would they say that, though, knowing it was? They're trying to cover up, probably, you know what I mean? So there wasn't no panic and everybody sort of like, just get on with everything, you know, so... Then, mysteriously, 50 minutes into the attack, the London Police Department orders the number 30 Hackney to Marble Arch bus to leave its normal route and to park at the corner of Woburn Square and Tavistock Place. At 9.47, a fourth bomb detonates, killing 13 civilians and injuring many others. Note, out of several hundred buses in service that morning, it's the only bus that the police take special control of and direct to Tavistock Square. I've been walking up and down this road, looking at the bus stops for a number 30. The bus stops have all the numbers of the buses on them individually. There's no number 30 on any of the bus stops. That's because the number 30 bus was specifically rerouted here on that day. To simplify it, there's no bus stop here. There's no number 30 bus stop here, no. Well, that was in the news that it was specifically diverted here. They admitted that the number 30 bus was the only bus that was directed to a different area of the city. For what reason? Nobody knows, but they admit that. So it's very strange that for no reason it would come down this road when it was bombed. Remember, while all this is happening, the police are on radio and TV telling everyone that it's just a power failure, an outage. Meanwhile, commuters on the bus were listening to other radio reports where eyewitnesses were reporting explosions. 
the supposed bomber on the bus with the rucksack became panicked and began looking in his rucksack in what witnesses said was a confused and frightened manner. Weeks later, police detectives investigating the case said that all four of the bombers on the three trains and the bus didn't fit the MO, the modus operandi, of bombers. They bought two-way tickets. They'd played games of cricket the night before. They had good jobs and happy families. One of the alleged bombers was caught by surveillance camera arguing with the ticket clerk about the price of his pass. After Scotland Yard detectives had a chance to talk to some of the eyewitnesses from the bus and the trains, they stated clearly on the record that they believed that the bombers did not know that they had explosives in their backpacks. This was only one of many huge developments in the case that only received bare mentions in the back of the newspaper. The July 29th edition of Fox News Channel's Dayside program revealed that the so-called mastermind of the 7-7 bombings, Harun Rashid Aswad, is a British intelligence asset. Former Justice Department prosecutor and FBI terror expert John Loftus exposed the fact that a SWAT was being protected by MI6 and was clearly under their control. A SWAT is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London from on the 7 7 and 7 21. This is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that, you, that the entire British police are out chasing him. And one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim sheikh said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working for the... So he's working for the Brits to try to give them information about Al-Qaeda, but in reality, he's still an Al-Qaeda operative. Yeah. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London. Now, we knew about this guy, Aswat. Back in 1999, he came to America. The Justice Department wanted to indict him in Seattle because him and his buddy were trying to set up a terrorist training school in Oregon. The headquarters of the U.S. Justice Department ordered the Seattle prosecutors not to touch Aswat. Hello. Now, hold on. Why? And that's... Well, apparently, Aswat was working for British intelligence. Now, there's a split of opinion within U.S. intelligence. Some people say that the British intelligence fibbed to us. They told us that Aswat was dead. And that's why the New York group dropped the case. That's not what most of the Justice Department thinks. They think that it was just, again, covering up for this very publicly affiliated guy with al Mujahideen. He was a mm -hmm. British intelligence plant. Our CIA says, uh, okay, let's arrest him, but the Brits say no again? The Brits say no. Now, the, at this point, two weeks ago, the Brits know that the CIA wants to get a hold of Haroon. So what happens? He takes off again, goes right to London. He isn't arrested when he lands. He isn't arrested when he leaves. Even though he's on a watch list. He's on a watch list. The only reason he could get away with that was if he was working for British intelligence. He wow. was a wanted man. And then takes off the day before the bombings, as I understand it, yeah, and goes to Pakistan. The Pakistan, Pakistan is arrested. They jail him. They jail him. He's released within 24 hours. In London, we spoke with David Shaler, a former MI5 agent who was convicted of breaking the Official Secrets Act and imprisoned for six months. With regard to 7-7, uh, there has been a witness report uh, now included in, in a local British newspaper called the Cambridge Evening News in which somebody who was on one of the tube trains says that he didn't see a man with a rucksack. In fact, after the explosion, what he saw was metal pointing upward from the bottom of the carriage. That would indicate, of course, that the bomb was not carried onto the tube train but was in fact attached underneath it. Now again, nobody in the British national press is following that up. Now, I hope investigators and the police are. A current member of British Parliament and a former cabinet minister in Prime Minister Tony Blair's government, Michael Meacher was sacked in 2003 for raising important questions on the eve of the Iraq war. 
atrocity of, of London bombings where 56 people were killed. We, uh, that was on the 7th of July, 7-7 we call it. Uh, it's a very convenient way of ensuring there is fear, uh, of ensuring that there is control, uh, and of ensuring that those uh, who are in the know, and of course we cannot tell you because it is all secret, uh, are in a position of extreme power. As part of our inquiry into the London bombing, we wanted to investigate the suspicious death of Jean-Charles de Mendez. Within days of his brutal murder at the Stockwell tube station in the London underground, evidence of a cover-up began to emerge. London police were later forced to admit that Mr. Dominez never ran from them, wasn't wearing a heavy coat, and that a special army unit had killed him execution style with over 10 shots to the head at point blank range. The British government was so desperate to keep the details of the shooting secret that they went so far as to arrest an ITN television journalist who had simply gotten a copy of what would normally be a public police report. Government whistleblowers and police have also been suspended and arrested for telling the truth. We had our details taken and were threatened with arrest simply for asking questions of locals outside the Stockwell station and videotaping police. Um, where are you based? Austin, Texas. Uh, Alex, what's your date, bro? Uh, 2 11 74. Would you just rather see the driver's license? No, that's okay. Well, here, just let me do it. Take it down. That's all I need, man. Well, I mean. And you're just uh, you're filming for a uh, program back in the States or something? Exactly. In fact, I think it'll probably be broken into. Uh, it'll probably be broken into. Think about it. Yeah. It'll, it'll, yeah. Sir, what do you think about this event? I think it's very bad that has happened. <laughs> what do you think should happen? I think the policy of shooting should have been more thoroughly thought out. I'm afraid there must have been a terrible mistake here. I feel very sorry for the family and very sorry for the policeman that made a horrible mistake. Yeah, it's going to be bad for everybody. It's a tragedy all around, I think. Thank you. The police first claimed that it was a hot morning when official weather reports showed that it was around 60 degrees and that Mr. Dimenez was running down the street wearing a giant padded coat with wires sticking out of it, that he vaulted over the turnstiles, charged through a crowd of pedestrians, raced onto the train, and was about to detonate bombs when the heroic officers gunned him down. The authorities then conveniently claimed that all the surveillance cameras malfunctioned that morning. Police have now been forced to admit, thanks to watchdogs in their ranks, that none of the cameras malfunctioned, and they've now released the video. The government has now been forced to admit that he was wearing a light denim jacket, and there were no wires of any type. Police that weren't part of the special military unit didn't know why they killed him. The police had followed him from his home. They knew that he was a Latin Brazilian working in England as an electrician. They followed him for 30 minutes as he walked from his home towards the station. Once in the station, he calmly bought a Metro paper, paid for his ticket with his Metro Oyster card, and then walked onto the train. Passengers then reported that they were told to get off the train. Once they'd stepped off, still looking through the windows, they saw the Special Forces police squat on Mr. Dominguez and shoot him over 10 times in the head. Witnesses said Dominguez looked at the authorities as if he knew them. He was like a scared rabbit, and he was killed execution style. The question is why. A special military hit team stalked him and tracked him from his home to the train station, and then killed him in cold blood, making sure he was dead. It's well known that if somebody has a bomb, you don't shoot at them, and you certainly don't get near them. No, Mr. Dominguez had seen something he wasn't supposed to see. He learned a little too much and he had to be eliminated. We were at the station just a week after he was killed, and many of the facts we've covered were already public knowledge. But still, some of the locals made excuses for the police. Within hours of the 7-7 bombings, Israeli Army Radio was reporting that Benjamin Netanyahu, the former Prime Minister of Israel, had been warned not to leave his hotel that morning to attend a meeting less than 100 yards away from one of the train stations that was bombed. The Associated Press ran the headline, Netanyahu changed plans due to warning. 
Then the current Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon's office, instructed Israeli officials not to give interviews to the foreign media concerning the warning. Israel's foreign office attempted to spin the story, saying that they'd given a general warning to the British that day. Then several weeks later, the head of Mossad told a major German newspaper that he indeed had issued a warning to Benjamin Netanyahu at 8.40 a.m., 10 minutes before the first blast. Conveniently for authorities, the bus surveillance camera malfunctioned. Something else happened that was convenient for the establishment line. All four of the supposed bomber's identification cards survived unscathed at all four events. But there was just one problem. In one case, one of the bomber's IDs was found at two separate locations. As the evidence mounts, it is crystal clear. Only criminal elements of the British government could stage the attacks and then engage in the cover-up. The reason the Netanyahu story is important is it clearly shows that other intelligence agencies were aware of what was going on in London that day and took necessary precautions to protect their Minister of Finance. In 1994, the Israeli embassy in London uh, was bombed. This was at a time when I was in the service. I joined the Middle Eastern section shortly after that, and I was actually astounded um, to read a document written by a senior MI5 officer who'd seen all the information coming in about this attack. And he said that he believed that the Israelis had bombed their own embassy. In any staged terror attack, governments have to be extremely careful to keep the operation shielded, compartmentalized. Most people in government are moral individuals who believe that they're standing up for their nation's sovereignty, for its national interest, and it's absolutely essential to keep them in the dark. One of the chief tools used by governments as a smokescreen is staging exercises or drills at the exact same time and exact same places as real events. When the Oklahoma City Federal Building was bombed, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was staging an anti-terror drill with their bomb squad on the morning of April 19, 1995, at the same time that the real event took place. On the morning of September 11, 2001, the Pentagon was running five separate drills, two of the drills targeting the exact same targets at the exact same time. That caused NORAD to stand down, believing it was just a drill. And London was no different. It's important to note that those taking part in the drills need not know that they're part of a larger operation. In fact, it's better for the conspirators that they not be informed. One of the chief reasons this is done is so that if any of the operatives carrying out the attack are caught by other elements of the government, they can simply claim that they were taking part in a drill or an exercise. NSA, InfoPol 9, and Echelon-type systems that are scanning for terrorist chatter will be fooled into believing they've simply picked up part of an exercise. On the morning of 7-7 in London, there was a simultaneous exercise targeting the exact same trains, the exact same bus, at the exact same locations at the very same time. What we're supposed to believe is some kind of coincidence. There was also an anti-terrorist drill going on on 7-7. And again, just like 9-11, they were talking about attacks on the same targets, the same kind of tube stations, and exactly the same time as the actual attack happened. We learned of the drills of 7-7 on 7-7 from Peter Power, the head of Visor Consultants, a crisis management firm based in London. Mr. Power was the former spokesperson for Scotland Yard. Mr. Power told National British Television, ITN News, about the drills. Uh, today we were running an exercise for a company, bearing in mind I'm now in the private sector, and we sat everybody down in the city, a thousand people involved in the whole organization, but the crisis team, and the most peculiar thing was, we based our scenario on the simultaneous attacks on the underground and mainline station. So we had to suddenly switch an exercise from fictional to real. And one of the first things is, get that bureau number. When you have a list of people missing, tell them. And so it took a long to, time. Just to get this right, you were actually working today on an exercise that envisioned yes. virtually this scenario. Uh, almost precisely. I was up until 2 o'clock this morning because it, it's our job. My own company, Visor Consultants, we specialize in helping people to get their crisis management response. How do you jump from slow time thinking to quick time doing? And we chose a scenario with their assistance which is based on a terrorist attack because they're very close to uh, a property occupied by Jewish businessmen. They're in the city and there are more American banks in the city than there are in the whole of New York. A logical thing to do. And it, I've still so got the... 
I was say, how extraordinary today <laughs> must feel for you as, as it unfolds. He repeated himself to BBC Radio 5. Uh, the thing that concerns me is that what are we doing for the thousands of men and women actually who are in London working? And I say that because at half past nine this morning we were actually running an exercise for a, over a, a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my legs standing upright. Did you get this quite straight? You were running uh, a, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this and it happened while you were running the exercise? Precisely. And it was uh, about half past nine this morning. We planned this for a company, and for obvious reasons, I don't want to reveal their name, but if they're listening, they'll know it. And we had a room full of crisis managers for the first time they met. And so within five minutes, we made a pretty rapid decision. This is the real one. Uh, and so we went through the correct, the correct drills of activating crisis management procedures to jump from slow time to quick time thinking yeah. and so on. If we use a standard actuary employed by major insurance companies to calculate the probability of these events coinciding in a 10-year mean, we learn that the probability of this happening is greater than 1 in 300 tretagillion. To put that in perspective, that's a number with 41 zeros behind it. That is trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and still more trillions times greater than all the grains of sand in all the world. To put that number in perspective, it has 41 zeros. Scientists using supercomputers have estimated that the Earth has over 7 quatillion grains of sand. A quatillion has 18 zeros. It would appear as some way of stopping the response of the emergency services or providing some kind of cover for what must be operations orchestrated in some way by the state. The evidence is overwhelming. All the telltale signs are there of government-sponsored terror. Only the British government had the know-how to carry out the attacks and to control the situation before and after the bombings. And of course, there's all the other admitted cases where the British government has hired terrorists to carry out assassinations or carried out bombings in their own country as a pretext for political control. And then, of course, there's qui bono, Latin for who benefits, who stands to gain. In the weeks leading up to 7-7, Tony Blair's poll numbers had fallen to the lowest point in his seven-year administration. His Labour Party was sure to lose the parliamentary elections. Support for the war was dismal. Despite the bombings, which did improve his approval ratings and support for the war, he was still only barely able to maintain control over the British House of Commons. In the wake of the bombings, Tony Blair's administration descended on the British people with a raft of tyrannical legislation attacking the press, freedom of assembly, and setting up the conditions needed for a martial law takeover of the nation through the Civil Contingencies Act. And of course, the bombings took place while world leaders were meeting in Scotland, so Bush and Blair could grandstand and blame the whole thing on Iraq, legitimizing their war. Despite the fact that the G8 World Summit was coming to England on July 7th, the British government lowered the terror threat on the London Underground in early June and conveniently lowered security.